Hi, everyone. Welcome to Chicago Autism Network's virtual parent workshops. Um, today, we are lucky to have Erica Smith from uh, Careville Autism Health. She's going to help us learn about how to be a friend to someone with autism. And I'll turn the time over to Erica. Thank you, Kimmy. Thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you to the Chicago Autism Network. Uh, so like Kimmy said, my name is Erica. I am a BCBA. I work at a company called Caravel Autism Health, and I'm here to present tonight on autism acceptance. Uh, April is one of my favorite months. Uh, it is autism acceptance month, and I'm going to be presenting a workshop and a training for how to be a friend to someone with autism. So a little bit of background on me. So I am the director for a clinic with Caraval Autism Health. Uh, my location is in Chicago. Um, and at this clinic, we provide early intervention services to, to kids and young adolescents that are diagnosed with autism. So I am a BCBA. Uh, which is a board certified behavior analyst. Uh, so my whole job is to analyze and change people's behavior. And I specifically am a subject matter expert in, in working with children with autism. And we do applied behavior analysis analysis, ABA therapy, uh, which is the gold standard in, in treatment and working with children with autism. And I've worked with autistic children and in the autistic community practicing ABA for over 12 years. Um, so like I mentioned, my, my company and the center that I run in Chicago, Caravel, uh, works, does early intervention for kids with autism. And our goal with early intervention is that we're helping them learn how to communicate, socialize, and play with their peers, and that accessing this intervention early in life really increases the likelihood that these autistic children can participate in school and the community without supports. Um, it's really, really rewarding work, and I've enjoyed doing this over my entire professional career. Um, just some fun facts about me. I love anything outdoors. You can find me skiing, hiking, skydiving, or traveling. And those are some pictures. Um, and the booth that I most recently had um, in Chicago Autism Network was there as well. I saw Kimmy um, and we had a wonderful expo a few weeks ago. So the purpose of today, um, so I'm going to be talking about a number of different things, but you know, I think really the goal here is that learning how to connect with an autistic person in your life. Um, for those of you that are joining this, this um, presentation live or maybe watching this recording, you likely have someone with autism in your life. It could be a child, it could be a student, a family member, um, but really what I'm here to provide is just some, some background and some information on what autism is, autistic traits, and really how to take that knowledge and understanding and, and develop a really meaningful relationship with the autistic person in your life. Um, understanding and embracing their differences and learning more about their traits and how neurodivergent and neurotypical people differ. So just cutting it down to the basics, right? What is autism spectrum disorder? So autism spectrum disorder is a developmental difference. So people with autism typically identify as neurodiverse and non-autistic people like myself identify as neurotypical. And so I'd like to highlight that this is a developmental difference. People with autism do develop differently. They perceive the world differently. They learn differently. And it's important that we understand those differences so that we can adapt our teaching style, adapt our interaction style, and really meet them where they're at um, and understanding those differences and how we interact with them. So autistic people typically have difficulty with social skills and interactions. A lot of the times with neurotypical people, you know, because we're wired a little bit differently, we perceive things differently. Um, but things like having a conversation, that back and forth reciprocal conversation, asking questions, playing and socializing with others, you know, playing with toys the way they're meant to be played with, um, making, making and maintaining friendships, all of those things. Um, are, are typically difficult for a person that's on the spectrum or they're delayed in learning some of those skills. Um, autistic people typically have repetitive behaviors. Um, these might be routines, having some really rigid routines and strict routines that they like to adhere to every day. Um, having special interests, we'll dive into special interests a little bit more later in the presentation. Um, and stimming as well, we'll talk about later in the presentation, but these are some really common um, autistic traits, these repetitive behaviors, that, that's a piece of being autistic. 
Um, also in this autism spectrum disorder is, is difficulty with communication and understanding nonverbal cues. Um, these could be things like understanding tone of voice or sarcasm, or when I say nonverbal cues, reading facial expressions for people or our body language, um, having difficulty navigating that, understanding those nonverbal cues and difficulty with that communication, communicating their wants and needs, being able to advocate, you know, if they need a break, if they want more of something, um, if they like something, they don't like something, um, those things, especially in young children, might be really delayed, uh, which is where kind of my, my early intervention and the work that I do comes into play as well. Um, and then lastly, sensory differences. Um, very, very common for people with autism. Um, these could be sensory differences when it comes to light, sound, touch, taste, and food. We'll talk about this again a little bit later in the presentation as well. Um, but just having just different um, sensory needs compared to a person that is neurotypical. Things may be way more overwhelming or underwhelming for a person that, that is autistic than a person that is not autistic. So. Those are, that's related to autism. And when I say autism spectrum disorder, what do I mean when I'm saying spectrum? So a spectrum means that there's a wide range of autistic traits and a wide range of um, level of supports. Um, so when we have a person who has more prominent autistic traits, you know, maybe they have more difficulty with communication, more difficulty with social skills, then we're needing to provide more substantial supports to them so that they can access the community setting, you know, the school setting, the home environment um, in a really appropriate way. And then we have all the way down the spectrum to requiring minimal supports. And so when it comes to a spectrum and, and depending how familiar you are with the autistic community, you might be very used to hearing the saying, when you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And that's so so, so true. Um, every autistic person is different. Their traits are different. Um, while there's a lot of commonalities, their autistic traits are different. And that means that our supports need to be different, that we need to individualize our supports to meet the needs of that person. And when I talk about supports, what do I mean by that? So supports are anything that helps a person function in their environment. And again, we have a wide range. We have a spectrum of supports. Um, so there's supports like what I provide, which are really substantial supports, intensive ABA applied behavior analysis. So, you know, part of my job is uh, um, providing those substantial supports early on in a child's life. So they're getting the intervention and supports that they need so that our goal is that we're fading out those supports by the time they go to school, they're able to access school and have less supports and require more minimal supports when they're in that setting. Um, and then some of those more moderate or minimal supports might be being pulled out of class for one-on-one -on -one instruction, getting away from that noisy distraction environment and working one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. It could be as simple as having their daily schedule written on a piece of paper for them. It might be a support that an autistic individual needs because they have difficulty with that executive functioning and that organization. So we're going to provide this support for them to help them access their, their environment. Um, or doing a checkup with a teacher after class. You know, did you... Do you have your pens and papers for the next class? You know, did you write down what your homework is? All of those things. Um, that's just another example of a minimal support. So when I say autism spectrum disorder, spectrum means there's just a wide range of what autism looks like and that our supports are also a spectrum to meet that person's individual needs. So what does autism look like? Um, I obviously have a nice array of pictures down here, and I think that it's important to start off that autism doesn't look like anything. You really can't tell that someone is autistic just by their appearance. Autistic people might present differently based on their age, this is true, um, and developmental milestones will most likely be delayed, especially when they're young. You know, I talked about this a little bit. Um, but, you know, for kids that are two to four, what does autism look like for, for a two to four year old? Again, it's going to be very individual based on that person. But some commonalities that we see is that their, their language might be delayed, that they're delayed speaking their first words um, or pointing or gesturing to things that they like. Um, the child might be nonverbal alt altogether. Um, they might have limited play skills and playing with a really set set number of toys um, or playing in a really restricted way, doing the same thing over and over with the toys and just being a little bit restricted in that area. 
Um, as kids get older, you know, maybe four to eight years old, you might see children who are autistic that may be verbal, but they struggle with that reciprocal conversation, that back and forth, that game of tennis that we play when we're having a conversation, right? I say something, you say something, we're on topic, we're going back and forth, that might be difficult for them. Um, they might think black and white, you know, that there's there's a way to do things and um, not really having a lot of abstract thinking or having difficulty with that abstract thinking that I should say, um, or difficulty regulating emotions, um, their emotional needs, understanding their feelings, why they feel a certain way and things might set them off a little bit more easily. Um, you know, what is what might autism look like for a kid that's 18 to 14 and, and even older? So, you know, same as the previous age group, you know, maybe we're talking about some uh, conversation difficulties, um, staying on topic, um, or having, you know, more of those inferencing skills, that abstract thinking. They, they want to make friends, but they struggle to do so. Um, you know, making friends for, for a person with autism, trying to make friends with somebody who's neurotypical. And we see the world, in, you know, in two different ways and we perceive things differently. That can be a little bit tricky. Um, so you may see an autistic individual who's a bit older that they prefer to spend time alone or engaging in screen time. Um, and again, I want to make it clear that I'm, I'm not meaning to make any generalities with the things that I'm, I'm talking about here. It's just a lot of commonalities that we see with people with autism. Um, and it, it's good to be aware of those things because it's important that if we learn what autism might look like through different ages, um, then how we can interact with them, um, how we can, you know, make uh, enter their world and, you know, be a part of what their world is and how to have that build that friendship with them. Okay, so talking about some autistic traits and things that are common for autistic people, and we're gonna, I'm gonna share some videos here with you guys as well. Um, so stimming, I, over my 12 years, I have never worked with a client who doesn't engage in some form of stimming. So stimming is a form of movement, typically like a body movement um, that autistic people do. It might be when they're happy, when they're excited or to help them self-regulate. So this might be like flapping their hands. It could be finger twirling. It could be spinning. It could even be making some vo vocalizations some movements um, with their mouth or making some certain sounds. Um, this is very, very common for, for kids that are autistic. And it's important to know that this is just a kid and a, even adults, um, I shouldn't say even, and adults who are autistic being themselves. And it's important to allow these individuals to stim um, because it's something that they like to express if they're feeling happy or excited or that they need to do to help regulate themselves. If they're feeling anxious or nervous and want to engage in this behavior to kind of help regulate. So with that, I have a video queued up um, about a young woman who has autism and she created a short YouTube video just to share with the world what stimming looks like for her.
Okay, and I did get a message. Today's video, we going to cover five different autism stims that you should know about. Here we go. Autism stims coming. Okay, sorry about that, guys. I did get your message in the chat that someone was not able to hear that video. Could, could, could anyone else confirm if you guys were able to hear the audio with that? I can hear. You were able to? Okay, good. So then it may be, we have a couple people. The, okay. the, the first video, um, I didn't hear, but the second video I heard. Okay. Thank you guys. So the first video, it just had music along with it. And it just, it just was the captions. I do have one more video to play. So we'll see um, if you guys are able to hear the audio with that. And if you're not, we'll skip over it. That's no big deal. Um, so going back to this one. So that was obviously um, just a video of that woman who was engaging in stimming. And so, you know, she was talking about that stimming for her is a way for her to express when she's excited, she's feeling happy. Um, so, you know, she rocks when it's her favorite TV program. And the reason I'm talking about some of this is that it's important to, to build that knowledge, to build that understanding that that stimming is and to normalize it, that stimming is something that autistic individuals engage in. And it's important to, to allow that and to understand that about them. Um, so this next video that I'm going to play, this one isn't a video, this is a podcast, a quick minute, minute and a half that we're going to listen to, um, is on special interests. So talked about this a little bit at the beginning, um, but in order to kind of, you know, understand autistic people, build a friendship with them, um, it's important to know that autistic people typically have special interests. Um, it might be, they might have one special interest, they might have multiple special interests. And the way that this differs from saying, I have a hobby, like I enjoy it. My hobby is reading books. My hobby is doing yoga. Um, a special interest is this really unique ability to completely dive into this topic that they know a lot about, and they may collect things that are related to this topic. Special interests can change over the time, or it could be one special interest for, for the entirety of their lives. Um, I've met some beautifully unique autistic individuals over the years with some amazing um, special interests and abilities. I met a four-year-old once. Um, his special interest was flags. He knew, I kid you not when I say all, he knew every single flag for all of the countries across the world. He could name them. He knew he knew the colors. He could pick it out of an array. That was his special interest, that he loved flags that belonged to all of the countries. And he knew a number of national anthems at, at four years old. It was really, really amazing and really special. And so I think it's important to know that autistic individuals typically have these special interests, and it's a really great way to be able to connect with them. These special interests might come across as weird, quote unquote, to you or atypical, um, but I think thinking of it through a lens about just how amazing it is to have that much dedication to a topic and a special interest to learn that much about it and be able to remember all of those amazing things lead to some really be wonderful, beautiful, unique people with some amazing talents who grow into some amazing professionals and some of which I'll highlight later um, in this presentation as well. But I digress. Um, so let's try this podcast, see if you guys are able to hear the audio. Just ping me in the chat if you're not able to, and I can give a little synopsis of what this audio is. Eli asks, if we know uh, why it's wrong to talk about your special interests all the time. I don't know, Robin, why do, do you think it's wrong to talk about your special interests all the time? Eli, I think the thing is, many autistic people think quite differently to neurotypical people and are often really focused on something in a way that maybe neurotypical people don't get so focused on. So because we're coexisting in different neurotypes, non-autistic people and autistic people, um, sometimes there's a bit of a clash in terms of what is interesting. So like neurotypical people, they often talk about stuff that autistic people think is boring, you know, like football, the weather, people, football, people, clothes, chit chat, yeah, social gossip, Love Island. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of autistic people that, you know, like those things individually. 
but autistic people tend to be focused on a narrower amount of topics. Obviously, we can't talk about every single autistic person because everyone is different. But basically, neurotypical people generally don't just want to talk about the one topic for a long period of time that they're not really interested in, just like we don't really want to talk about loads of little topics and we're not interested in like the weather, football, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So sadly, there isn't any therapy available for neurotypical people to make them more autistic so they can cope with this world. So we're just going to have to put up and give them some tolerance. But equally, there's no therapy to make autistic people neurotypical people. And that's a good thing. We need all the neurotypes to be together. I'm saying this slightly tongue in cheek because whenever somebody says to me, well, you know, my kid goes on about their special interests, they phrase it like a problem with their kid versus I'm like, well, no, you go on about stuff I don't care about. So it's really a different of perspective. Well, what I'd suggest, Eli, is you find people that are interested in the same things you are, talk to them about those things. Being neurotypical has its pros and its cons, just as being autistic does. And we all have to find a way of living together and being tolerant of one another. So go and find the people who are your tribe, if you like, the people that are interested in things you're interested in. There are lots. Okay, so this is um, one of my favorite podcasts, 1800 Seconds on Autism. And here you could hear that both of the co-hosts um, who are autistic talking about special interests. And I really like that they highlight um, that, you know, neurotypical people like myself, I identify as neurotypical, um, that we talk about loads and loads of little topics, um, things that might not interest a person who is autistic, and that autistic people might have one topic that they want to spend a lot of time talking about, that is their special interest. And there's nothing wrong with either of those. I think it's understanding that there, that we need to embrace different neurotypes, uh, like the one co-host said, that we have neurodivergent people, neurotypical people, and to understand that about each other, and that one is not better or worse um, or more or less than the other. Uh, but just kind of highlighting that that special interest and that it's important to know that that person with autism in your life, what is their special interest? How can I connect with them on this topic? Um, and then lastly, just another common autistic trait is, is having some sensory overload, being overloaded by um, the, the, our sensory world and our environment. Um, when there's too many people, like a really crowded space that could be typically overwhelming for a person with autism, loud sounds, um, a lot of unfamiliar people, you know, when um, a person with autism might have to interact with a lot of unfamiliar people, that can be really overwhelming and really draining on them. Because maybe that unfamiliar person is expecting to talk about a lot of little things like the weather, and like how their drive was to get there what they had for lunch. And that's just that can be exhausting for a person with autism. Um, to have that back and forth conversation or for them to not understand, you know, their their autism and how they go about navigating a social conversation um, or just new social situations in general. Experiencing something new for the very first time can be really overwhelming. Again, understanding that people with autism, you know, they, they develop differently, that they're, they're wired a bit differently, perceive the world in a different way and experience the world in a different way. Um, so that just jumping into a new social situation can be really, really overwhelming. So it's important to know, um, are some of these autistic traits something that that is in the person with autism in, in your life and understanding that, and then kind of how to adapt yourself or, or just be aware of these things um, as you're in, engaging in a, a friendship or relationship with them. Okay, so moving, so kind of, you know, before we get to the to the next steps of making some suggestions with how to specifically, you know, be a friend to someone with autism, um, just some some fun facts, some a little bit of stuff I already went over. Um, but like I mentioned before, you know, there's there are dozens of famous people who are autistic. I'm sure way more than dozens. Um, but you know, as we grow and you know evolve as a society and there's a lot more acceptance around autism, we're seeing a lot more adults now um be open with with their diagnosis or maybe getting diagnosed later in life because now there's a lot more awareness around autism um but some people some famous people i just wanted to highlight if you guys didn't know uh the creator of pokemon is autistic elon musk is autistic tim burton um who is a wonderful film creator uh is autistic dan Harmon, it's a tv show community if you haven't heard of it it's a very good tv show he's also autistic and so i think you know this really ties back to the conversation i was having before about special interests um that you know a lot of these people i'm sure that they 
have these special interests, you know, in the media that they create or the technology they create like Elon Musk um, and really dove in. And because they have this ability to dive into this special interest in such a way that neurotypical people typically can't, that they are so successful and have created some really amazing things. Um, so really thinking about, is that special interest weird or is that really cool? And could that lead to a really successful and happy life for this person? Um, so again, there's a lot more other, you know, very well-known people with autism out there. And I just like to highlight, you know, all of the amazing successes that autistic people uh, create for us. Um, some other just like, did you know facts that having disrupted sleep is, is very common um, for people with autism, kids all the way through adulthood. Um, and it, this could happen every single night. Um, and really knowing that if if their sleep is poor, if they're constantly having disrupt, disrupted sleep, that it can put them on edge for the next day and make their triggers even more triggering for them. So it's important to know this about the person in your life. Do, do they have disrupted sleep? How does that impact them the next day? What do I need to do then the next day in order to make, to make them in a better place and to make their day a little bit? bit easier. Um, understanding that they have, this might be this disruptive sleep coming into the next day. A lot of changes are happening in their routine. We're planning to go to a new place. Maybe it's not the best day to do those things because um, that could really put that person into, into a shutdown mode where they, they just don't have the capacity to process all of those different changes um, because of the night sleep that they had before. Um, just touched on this a little bit, um, but there, there are a lot of common triggers across people with autism. Um, some of these are mostly for young children, um, but definitely plays into adolescence and adulthood as well. Uh, you know, with young children, we, we definitely see, um, with being told no to their preferred items or their activity at that time. Um, of course, you know, with young children, a lot of young kids have difficulty. I apologize if you guys can hear a train horn behind me. There's the train outside my house. Not great timing. Um, but a lot of kids, you know, do have difficulty with, with hearing the word no and not being able to have their preferred things. What, what we see with young children is really this um, intensity around being told no or denied access. Um, that can be, that being told no, that delay can be a common trigger for them um, and transitions away from those preferred items. Again, kind of touching back to the sensory piece of it, loud sounds, bright lights, really strong smells, or certain textures of their clothing might be triggering for them. Um, anything that's unexpected or a change in their routine could be something that could, you know, set them off potentially, or again, going back to those overwhelming situations. So while again, kind of talking about the work I do with, with early intervention and applied behavior analysis, these are things that we work on to help these children build tolerance to these things um, or learning different coping strategies when these things happen in their environment. Those are important skills to teach and those are things that, that we work on through therapies and different interventions. But it's also important that that these triggers are most likely going to stay with this person throughout their life. And if you're going to have a friendship with them or a romantic relationship with them or even a working relationship with them, it's important to know these things about them um, so that you can navigate that relationship in the best way possible. Okay, so kind of now moving on to the meat of our presentation after talking about, you know, what is autism? What does spectrum mean? What are some common traits and some things to know? You want to be a friend to this person with autism. So where do you start? So first and foremost, know what they like. Um, all friendships are based uh, most of the time on common interests. And kind of going back to that, typically um, autistic people have very specific special interests. So you want to get to know what those special interests are. Do you have commonality with that? Um, or if you're just learning how to start a relationship with them, maybe it's a new student in your classroom, maybe it's your, your own child and you're trying to figure out how to connect with them, start there with that special interest. And this could look different based on the child's age. You know, if it's a two-year-old, maybe their special interest, they have these two brightly colored blocks and they really, really like them. They love to carry them around. They like to sleep with them. These blocks are their favorite things. They're so into it amazing. Let's start there. Let's play with those blocks together. Can I get other blocks that look like those blocks and we can build something together? Um, or it could be, you know, a teenager or a young adolescent. 
and their special interest is is Pokemon, for example. Um, and that's that's all they love to talk about. They love to watch videos on it. They love to read magazines on it. So let's connect there. You know, let's make a game out of this. Let's talk about it. Let's go to the comic book store and we can buy one together. Really connecting on, on those things that they like to start off that relationship and friendship. Um, it's very important that you understand their differences and that you don't judge them, accept them exactly for who they are, just as you want them to accept you. Um, stimming. We don't want to stop our autistic friends um, and family members from stimming. That's important for them to engage in, and, and it's part of who they are. And it's a part of um, us learning to accept that and not judging that and wanting to change it because it's not something that we're used to. Um, so get to know your friend, accept them for who they are. Um, again, kind of coming back to those triggers, that is important to know for a person with autism in your life. Um, they could be, you know, we touched on this, sounds like texture, smells, all those good things. So if your friend is, is sensitive to loud sounds, you probably don't want to take them to the air and water show. That could be a very difficult experience for them. We can most likely find something else to do together. Um, and then this last one down here is, you know, understanding their battery. So autistic people do experience burnout at a faster rate. They have to make choices every day to avoid shutting down. Neurotypical people, we're on a pretty regular cycle, right? We were able to wake up, we drive to work, maybe um, there's an accident along the way, we get delayed or we have to take a different route to work, no big deal. We get to work, we manage all sorts of different problems and different conflicts at work. Maybe the power goes out and we have to work through that or the toilet gets clogged and we have to work through that. And then we come home and we're out of groceries so we have to order dinner. All of those things we're able to navigate through and those changes and those hurdles. And then we go to sleep, our battery fills up and then we're back at it the next day. For a person who is autistic, all of those things throughout a day can be so, so draining. And we'll talk about this a little bit more on the next slide. Um, but pairing that again with having a difficult night's sleep where they're not able to recharge that battery and then going into a day like I just explained with all of those hurdles really can lead to a shutdown mode for a person with autism. And so again, it's important to know how are they starting off their day? What did their sleep look like the night before? Is there anything that I can do then to, to decrease some of these hurdles? If it's a young child, if it's your child or a student you have in your classroom, just knowing that their batteries are much different than ours. And, and it's important for us to understand that so we can support them throughout the day. Okay. So the spoon theory, I'm not sure if anybody um, is familiar with this theory. So this theory was um, first created by Christine Miserandino. And so Christine has a chronic illness herself and she was at the diner with her friend and she was trying to explain to her friend how her battery every day is different than her friend who doesn't have um, a chronic illness or, or mental health disorder. Um, so I like to, and the spoon theory, the podcast that I played for you guys, 1800 Seconds on Autism, they talk about this theory a lot. It is popular in the autistic community um, and in the neurodivergent community. But thinking about how our energy that we have is a, a drawer full of spoons. Neurotypical people might have unlimited amount of spoons, or we might just have a lot more spoons than neurodivergent people do. And so a person who is autistic, thinking about the spoon theory, is that there's so many spoons um, related to each of these components, right? Executive functioning, physical activity, social, your focus, your sensory and your language, your communication um, skills, and that you have a set number of spoons for each of these different categories. And for every person who's neurodivergent or, ha or has autism, different number of spoons for each of these categories, or maybe every day you wake up and it changes the number of spoons that you, that you are able to have within this. And then thinking about for every choice that you make, you're spending a spoon, you're taking a spoon out of your drawer, getting out of bed is one spoon, reading and studying is two spoons, socializing, oh, that's big, that's three spoons I'm losing there. And then going to work, that's the biggest one of all, that's four spoons, because I kind of got to um, do all of that together, my executive functioning, physical, social, all of that is happening at work, so that takes the most spoons. 
So then by the end of the day, autistic people, or even halfway through the day, depending how their day goes, if they go through all of those hurdles, like needing to take a different route to, to go to work, um, or having the power go out and having to navigate that, that's a new social situation I got to navigate, we're losing spoons left and right. And so by the end of the day, halfway through the day, we might be getting to shutdown mode. And that people with autism can take longer to recharge that battery. And it might not just be one night's sleep. It might be a day, two days, three days where they need to, to recharge, get those spoons back in their drawer to be able to spend again the next day. So it's important to know that for people with autism and just the that that burnout is going to happen more often and giving them that space to recharge, not putting pressure on them to engage in certain social situations. I'll talk about that a little bit more on, on the next slide, um, but really understanding what is their energy battery look like? How is that different than mine? And how do I adjust and change my expectations based on that? Okay, so kind of moving into the next slide and then breaking um, how to be a friend to someone with autism and some of my suggestions just based on their age level. So if we're thinking about a two to four year old and they might have, they might be nonverbal or they might have some limited vocal skills, limit or restricted play interest, or maybe they have some low interest in others, especially children. Maybe they're not showing interest in other children. Um, maybe they they do um, like connect with other adults in their lives, or maybe they don't, and maybe kind of are just in their own world. How, how do I start connecting with them? What is it that I can do? So some suggestions. So thinking about the communication for if they're nonverbal or they have limited vocal skills, um, some ways that you're able to start connecting with them, building this friendship, giving choices, you know, having two tangible objects, you know, do you want the, the ball or do you want the book? Following their eye contact. If they're, if they're delayed in learning to reach or to point to what they want, let's follow their eye contact. They're going to show me what it is that they're interested in. And I can then determine what their interests are. What are their likes? How can we connect that way? Um, reaching or pointing to the item they want. Some suggestions on how to start building that, that relationship with them, you know, while the child is playing is narrate and comment on play all the time. So when I mean narrate and comment, I don't mean asking questions because if you're, if you're a young friend who's two to four already struggles with a lot of vocal skills and communication, we don't want to ask questions expecting them to answer because they might not be able to, and that could be frustrating for them. So instead, how can I engage with them that isn't putting that pressure on communication? So when I say comment, I mean, when you guys are playing together, you're playing next with them. Oh, look, you stacked the blocks. You have a red block. You have a blue block. I'm going to crash your blocks. You're really just narrating and providing a lot of enriched uh, language environment while you're playing with them. Um, just using short sentences, you know, a good rule of thumb that we usually stick to is only speak one to two words more than the child already has. Um, we don't want to overwhelm them with a lot of words, a lot of fancy words or adjectives or things like that. Um, we want to make this interaction with them not to have a lot of pressure, um, not to be overwhelming, not to be confusing, that we're really paying attention to them and getting on their level and meeting them where they're at. Um, when it comes to their play, you know, play with toys, how they want to play them. If they want to stack those blocks and knock them over 20 times in a row, sounds good. That's what we're going to do. Cause I, I see you, I see that's what you want to play. I'm going to honor that. And we're going to do that together. And this is what we called in my world is called pairing that we are pairing ourselves with a really fun activity, a fun activity that is fun for that child. It might seem different to us. It might not be the way that a neurotypical child plays with something, but if we're wanting to build that, that budding friendship, that relationship with them, regardless if this is your child, again, a student, a friend, whomever, um, seeing how they wanna play with something and you doing that right alongside with them, commenting on it and having, having a good time and accepting the way that they wanna play. Um, and if they wander away, don't take offense to that. Go right along with them. They might just be getting up to find another toy, but they don't have the ability to communicate that to you yet. So, so don't take offense as, you know, your typical people, if we walk away, it usually means that, that we're done with something, but it doesn't necessarily mean that for an autistic individual. Um, so you can get up, you know, go, go follow them, keep engaging in the play that they're, that they're wanting to play with. Um, and you know, if you're, if this two to four year old might have low interest in others, maybe low interest in children, 
Um, some of my suggestions are, you know, pay, pay attention to their nonverbal cues. Um, if they're showing low interest in others, then it, that's common for an autistic child because other kids can be really unexpected. We don't know what kids are going to do, if they're going to take my toy, if they're going to yell really loud all of a sudden, like there's a lot of unexpected things that go along with, with neurotypical children um, that kids with autism might want to stray away from because they don't really know what's going to happen. And again, thinking that, you know, those unexpected things, those changes, those loud sounds can be really triggering for them or very overwhelming. It makes sense that they kind of want to stray away from those things. So when you're engaging in, in play with your child, right, we really want to make sure that you're, you're paying attention to their nonverbal cues, because right now that's how they're, they're communicating with you, their wants and needs, if, if their language is delayed. So if they're pushing things away, if they're whining or showing any disinterest, that's their communication for you to stop. And you should honor that, that I hear you, I see you, I understand you're trying to communicate with me, and you know we're going to stop doing this, and really to gain their trust and show that that you're going to listen to them. So moving on um, to the next age group, so you know maybe four to eight years old, um, they might have verbal language, but maybe it's limited or one sided. Like they're fine, they are starting to have some communication on. And but it might be one sided. Maybe there's not a lot of back and forth conversation going on. Um, they're not initiating conversation with you, still having some limited or restrictive play interest and maybe having some low interest in others. Or maybe now they're, they're showing some resistance to, to trying new things. Um, so my suggestions is have, I work on with parents a lot on this to not ask a lot of questions. So adults really easily fall into this with their neurotypical kids asking, how was your day? What did you do? Who did you play with? Um, all of those are placing an expectation that then that autistic individual needs to answer us. And so for a person or a child who already struggles with communication and socialization, putting this pressure on them to answer your questions they might see, perceive as pointless, quote unquote, um, might, might just hinder your relationship even more, or they might start to disengage. And kind of, again, going back to that podcast, you know, the two autistic adults were talking about um, some of that small talk that we like to make that they might perceive as just like silly or pointless, or why do you want to know these things? Um, so for neurotypical people, we're very used to engaging in that type of conversation. And we might just need to change our way of thinking about that, you know, when, when working, playing, talking with uh, an autistic individual. Um, so my suggestion with this, you know, is instead really go back to that commenting. Instead of asking questions about how was your day? What did you do today? Comment like, oh, hey, it was really nice outside today. I hope that you got a chance to go play outside. And that leaves the door open for them to participate in that conversation if they want to, if they have the social battery to do so based on how their day went. Um, you know, you could comment and say, I saw in the lunch medal, you had pizza today. Like, that sounds so good. I love pizza. Um, and really kind of going back to that that commenting and letting that person um enter that conversation with you if if you know they're they're looking to um some other things are just with the the play so again kind of going back to play how they want to play um setting some clear expect expect expectations excuse me if you want to play with something that you like so first then expectations are really really helpful or, or using a lot of foreshadowing so first, we're going to play my game for five minutes, and then we can play your game. Maybe it's your friend who's super into Pokemon, and they've been talking a lot about Pokemon, but you, your part of this relationship is also important. You also want to be able to share your interests and do things that you want to do. And so setting some really clear expectations. Okay, first, let's talk about my day. I want to tell you what I did in art class. Let's do that for five minutes. Then we can go back to talking about Pokemon and just being very clear and kind of going back to that. How can I make this very black and white um, with setting some clear expectations? Uh, we talked about this last one in the previous slide, right? But, but kids can be unexpected to someone with autism. Don't know what they're going to do or what they're going to say. And we might see, you know, we do see that autistic children often turn towards screens. I know kids do this in general, right? Screen time is big for, for the youngest kids of, of our newest generation. Um, 
And especially with kids with autism, when this social world can be very overwhelming, you know, ever changing, that we might see them turn more towards screen time. Screens are highly reinforcing, they're predictable, they know exactly what's going to happen when they push this button, and they don't have to change themselves when they're on a screen. They don't have to mask or answer questions about the weather or how their day was. They can just engage in the play that they that they want to do over and over again. And friendships with normies, quote unquote, um, can be hard. So how can we make this easier? So again, kind of meeting them where they're at. If they have a really preferred game on their on their iPad or on their tablet, whatever, how can I take that preferred game on their screen and turn that into an interactive game? How can we make that real life and us play that together? Um, so maybe it's something, you know, with Minecraft. How can we make that real life? How can, can we make some boxes or, you know, play this in the living room? Like, how can we turn this into something that you and I can do together? So knowing what their interests are, meeting them where they're at and trying to fold yourself in, into that world with them. Okay. I'm going to keep moving along. So I got time for questions at the end. Um, so on to the, the older age group, right? Still the same, um, you know, deficits that we're looking on the left-hand side, verbal, maybe one-sided, restricted play interest, resistant to trying new things. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, as, as our kids get older, you know, don't get hung, hung up on eye contact. Don't get hung up on body language. You might perceive someone not looking at you, crossing their arms or turning away as signs of disinterest or avoiding, but, but that's because we're neurotypical. I'm a normie. That's how I'm used to perceiving things because that's the way that I do things when I'm trying to communicate something. But it's really typical for autistic kids and adults to have limited eye contact, a black and white way of thinking and viewing the world. Um, so, you know, thinking about that, that conversation, that communication piece, talk about their interests comment on your own interests and find, again, find your ways to, to fold yourself into what they like. Don't get too hung up on, on the body language and on the eye contact because um, autistic individuals just communicate those things differently than neurotypical people do. You don't play how they want to play. Again, it's kind of going back to that setting clear expectations, setting first, then first, we're going to do something that I want to do. Then we're going to do something that you want to do and following through with that so that you're a trustworthy person. Um, hold your interests into there. They really love Mario Kart, but it would mean a lot for to you if they would play basketball with you. Um, so how can you combine the two? How can you get creative? This is their special interest. This is my hobby, but something I really want to do with my son. How can we do these two things together and make it a really fun activity? And then that way they're getting to try something new, but they're more likely to do it because we're incorporating a special interest that they already know that they really like. Um, again, uh, young adolescents, you know, might be resistant to trying new things again, not, not all, but some, um, so making a plan to try something new and follow it up with a preferred activity. So again, thinking that, you know, unplanned things, unexpected changes in routine can be triggering for kids with autism. So having a plan is good on this day, a week from now at this time, you know, we're going to go out and play soccer. And afterwards, we're going to go to the comic book store. Um, provide details. You know, you could write a short story. You could show them pictures. Giving them a lot of information before they experience this new social setting is really going to set them up for, for success. Um, because again, kind of going back to those triggers, unexpected things, a new social situation, those can be really overwhelming. So what can you do to make that situation less overwhelming for them, but still get that opportunity to experience those new things with your son, um, your friends, your students, things like that. And then providing just lots of reassurance for trying something new, giving them a lot of confidence. Okay, so some quick just reminders of things on um, not to do. So I think things that we talked about, don't stop your child or your friend from stimming. Don't pressure them to mask. Don't pressure them to mm, come across as though they're neurotypical. They are autistic. It's wonderful and beautiful that they are autistic and accept all of those autistic traits that that person has to offer. Don't pressure them to engage in social situations. Consider how many spoons are in their drawer. What does their battery look like that day? Um, don't take offense when their nonverbal cues don't meet your expectations. They're not looking at you. Their body's turned away from you. 
don't take offense to it. Not a big deal. Um, and don't spring changes on them if you can avoid it. Foreshadowing is going to be your friend. Um, and I found this nice little clip, just some autistic love languages. They're sharing experiences with you. Unmasking is a big one. Them feeling comfortable to stim in front of you, to info dump, you know, talk all about their special interests, um, you know, sharing things with you. Really, that unmasking is really going to show that this this person is comfortable with me. We've built a good friendship and, and they trust me. And that's a really beautiful thing. Last thing, and then I'm going to move right on to questions on um, just some suggested content. You know, I love that all of you are here engaging in this training, you know, for when you meet somebody who's different from you, the best thing to do is to learn about that person and gain some understanding. So you guys attending this, this workshop is a first step towards that. Um, so some other areas that you can look towards for media, some wonderful podcasts out there, 1800 seconds on autism. I absolutely love this podcast. It was a clip I was playing for you guys earlier. Um, autism by Autistics is another great podcast. There's some great movies out there. This list obviously is not extensive, um, but just some that, that I really like. Uh, Jack of the Red Hearts, Temple Grandin, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. And some wonderful TV shows, Parenthood, Love on the Spectrum, highly recommend a very beautiful TV show. Everything's going to be okay and atypical um, are all some nice podcast movies and TV shows that you guys can look into if you're wanting to expand your knowledge surrounding autism. All right. And again, ending with one of my favorite quotes and a very um, a favorite quote in the autistic community. When you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Um, thank you guys for engaging in this training with me. I would love to pause and take some questions that you all have. Mm -hmm.